All right. This one is an old term. I just can't shake it. Laryngeal papillomatosis. This is actually HPV infection now. I was corrected on that by a resident some years ago. Uh, but I still call it laryngeal papillomatosis. You get these polyps in your trachea. And then it's often associated with cystic changes in the lungs. They'll get nodules in the lungs to begin with. And then those nodules will shell out and create a very thin-walled cyst. So a very thin-walled cyst always makes me think of laryngeal papillomatosis. And look how irregular that trachea was. And again, thin-walled cyst with a bunch of nodules, right, that are yet to shell out completely. The differential on this, when I see an irregular trachea like that and then cystic changes in the lungs, it can always be Wegener's granulomatosis. Now with Wegener's, you might wanna see a little airspace disease for the hemorrhage, but if it's not active, that may not be present. The trachea in Wegener's tends to be more stenosed and irregular and not actually polypoid like this one. Uh, but it can be a difficult thing to, uh, to sort those out. Usually uh, some more clinical evaluation will be required. So that is laryngeal papillomatosis. All right, another cystic lung disease. This one associated with small nodules as well. And that's the way I always think of this. Small, irregular cysts with no wall and tiny nodules simultaneously. That is eosinophilic granuloma. And this is the eosinophilic granuloma that affects the lungs, right? This is usually female smokers in their 40s, right? And this is a, a different thing from EG in kids. And that's different from eosinophilic pneumonia, which is the peripheral consolidation stuff. All right, so small cysts with no walls and associated nodules usually more pronounced in the upper lobes, but not always. This one is pretty extensive, and uh, it's probably the most extensive I've actually seen. Pretty much all the lungs are involved here. All right, so that's pulmonary EG. All right, another cystic lung disease. This one is a case of tuberous sclerosis. So the cysts here, again, are a little bit larger. Also, no discernible wall, right? And this is lymphangiomyomatosis. You can see this patient has fat density liver lesions. Unbelievable number of fat density renal lesions, right? <laughs> And small bone islands, multiple bone islands, you can see there's one in the sacrum too, uh, are also a tip-off for tuberous sclerosis. So this patient pretty much has it all. So here's the LAM. The cysts are a little larger than in EG, but otherwise kind of similar in appearance. Again, no wall to them. So all those liver lesions renal angiomyolipomas. And again, the bone islands. I didn't show you the, the video on the bone islands, but case of tuberous sclerosis with LAM. All right, a few cases of sarcoidosis. So first of all, you can see there's mediastinal adenopathy. This I would put in the prevascular space. And there is dense consolidation there in the left hilar region, but here's where your trick of looking to the periphery really helps. When you look to the periphery of that, right, right in the hilar region, what can you tell about that? Really nothing, it's just densely consolidated and it can't be characterized. But you go out to the periphery and you start to appreciate the nodular appearance. And for sarcoid, seeing subpleural nodularity, uh, that is definitive, right? That's the thing. When I start thinking, is this sarcoid? 
I go and try and find subplural micronodularity because that will just seal the deal. All right, so uh, peribronchovascular involvement is the other classic. And if you look to the anterior portion, you can see that that density is tracking out along a uh, bronchovascular bundle. And that is a very helpful thing. It has the same essential significance as subplural nodularity. So if you were still wondering, you've got adenopathy and subplural nodularity here, pretty good for sarcoid. But this seals the deal. I actually remember uh, this case from private practice, and I was sitting there, you know, thinking, ah, maybe sarcoid. And I scrolled down into the abdomen and saw this spleen and said, what the? <laughs> I'd, for whatever reason, I'd never seen it before. But I was in private practice in Spokane, Washington, where there is something terrible in the water. And there were a lot of cases, in spite of it being a West Coast city, there are a lot of cases of Crohn disease and sarcoid, which is unusual because it's mostly an East Coast disease. And I was sitting there looking at this spleen and uh, a good friend of mine walked behind me and he was he was clever. And he looked over my shoulder and he said, sarcoid. And he walked off and I thought, oh, thank God he was here. <laughs> I think I was going to call it sarcoid based on the lungs, but I had no idea what to do with this spleen. And of course, at this point, I've seen it a number of times. We'll see even a few more. Uh, so that is sarcoidosis. And uh, always, of course, when you say sarcoid or TB, always consider or other granulomatous processes. So there is the prevascular adenopathy. And there is that spleen. It's just huge and absolutely filled with these small hypodense lesions. Right, and here are those lung findings. Again, look to the edge of that consolidated region to characterize the process. So right there, I think you can really appreciate that subpleural nodularity right along that major fissure in the left lung. I'll let it go one more time just so you can see that. All right, that is sarcoidosis. Here's another sarcoid. Of course, sarcoid is one of the great mimickers, right? It can look like almost anything. But when you see something that is really obviously peribronchovascular, that actually is uh, one of those differential lists that's pretty helpful because it's relatively short, right? When I see peribronchovascular uh, density, I basically think of sarcoidosis, Kaposi sarcoma, and lymphangitic tumor. It's almost always going to be one of those three. So there's the peribronchovascular density. You see it's tracking out along these bronchovascular bundles. And we have another case of liver and spleen hypodensities here. Similar to the last one, but not as extensive, but certainly helpful. All right, so look at that tracking all out along the bronchovascular bundles with a certain nodular character to it. That is another case of sarcoidosis. There are the soft tissue windows just to let you appreciate the liver and spleen stuff. In fact, I'll let it run one more time and really look at that liver. They're pretty subtle. But if you're really focused on it, you can really start to see they're quite numerous. All right, so that's sarcoid with peribronchovascular density. So another peribronchovascular density, so you can learn to recognize this and also see it's pretty tough to sort uh, out sarcoidosis versus Kaposi sarcoma. So again, density tracking along the peribronchovascular bundles. It's so dense, in fact, that you can see it pretty well on soft tissue windows. You see that, you know, when you get to the lung windows, it's going to be striking, but you can really see the thickening around the bronchi in this example. I think it uh, is just a perfect example of peribronchovascular density.
Right, so here it is on the lung windows. And that is Kaposi sarcoma. Pretty tough to differentiate from sarcoid. But note, no mediastinal adenopathy, no splenic involvement. And so a couple of things you might hang your hat on, not present for sarcoid. All right. This one is industrial lung disease. Now, silicosis can look like sarcoid. It has a tendency to form nodules in the upper lobes. It will have calcified hilar lymph nodes. In fact, the classic in silicosis is eggshell calcification, which is a rim of peripheral calcification. What silicosis and, for that matter, co-workers pneumoconiosis ultimately progresses to is what's called PMF, or progressive massive fibrosis. Also, I've seen it described as coalescent nodularity. So this started as a whole bunch of nodules, but over time, they all kind of coalesce together and create these mass-like densities in the upper lobes. Okay, so there are the calcifications in the hyla and within the masses themselves. And so that, uh, I heard that phrase once, industrial lung disease, and that's a great way to characterize these. Uh, this kind of thing, silicosis, arose from granite quarries, uh, people that worked in quarries and breathed in basically the dust of stones over a long period of time, uh, kind of similar to co-workers pneumoconiosis. We saw a lot of this when I was at Dartmouth because they, it's the granite state and they had a lot of quarries in the region. So here it is on the coronal, and you can see the periphery, that whole trick of looking at the periphery, gives you a sense that there is still a little nodularity to it, especially in that left lung, right on the underside of that giant mass-like density. There you go. Still appreciate the nodules in that left lung. All right, so that is silicosis, or industrial lung disease. All right, just a couple more, some strange infections. Aspergillosis, I heard the fingers in a glove finding a million times, and I never really appreciated it. I always uh, envisioned kind of an endobronchial lesion, and sometimes you can get that. Uh, but I think this is what people are really talking about when they talk about fingers in a glove. There's basically a stricture at the branch point of bronchi, and then the bronchi emanate out from there and dilate up, filled with fluid and fungus. So this is aspergillus, and you can really appreciate that that's what's going on here on the coronal. Right? So all these lobulated things kind of arrange like fingers in a glove. So that is aspergillosis. There are many forms of abs, uh, aspergillosis, of course. You can have the allergic type, which is ABPA, and then you can have this bronchial, and then it can actually progress to angioinvasive as well. So here it is on the coronal. See, all those are just lobulated, dilated bronchi emanating from one point. All right, have another case of aspergillosis here. This one, pretty dramatic. Again, big dilated bronchi emanating out from the hyla. In this case, though, there are also these, uh, essentially they look like bronchiectasis, but large shelled out kind of linear uh, cystic lesions. These are a later phase where essentially these infected bronchi will shell out. And so you can see both in any given case. And this is a nice example. All right, so here is the complete extent. Right middle and left upper lobe are predominantly involved, but you can see the right lower lobe and lingula have been involved at some point in the past.
And here it is on the soft tissue window. And the thing to note here is the density of those endobronchial contents. They're extremely dense. Very helpful that this is a non-contrast scan as well. Right? And that is a characteristic of fungal infections in general. When you see that kind of density uh, that, that seems to be extreme, you know, usually um, infected regions might look a little bit dense, but usually heterogeneous and not this extremely dense compared to other soft tissue. So the other place where this comes up all the time is in sinusitis, when you see that kind of density within a sinus suggests that it could be a fungal sinusitis. All right, so that is aspergillosis.